people think, you know, digital transformation as uh, this thing you can just buy and get. Uh, and you see the end result and not really think about all that needs to happen um, along that path. Um, I've heard people talk about just migrating to the cloud as being part, you know, as di I'm now digitally transformed or buying some new servers as I'm now transformed digitally. No. What really, if you think about things, um, the core to what a business does or why a business is in, is in existence is to serve, to acquire new customers, maintain, new co maintain those customers, and deliver value to them. And what really has been driving this transformation, evolution as I call it, is the, the new customer expectations. Um, the, the, it's not the technology, it's the expectations of your customers, which you have to deliver value to. Technology really is like an accelerant, it's like throwing gas on the fire, it makes it happen faster. So that's really what, you know, what's driving this. Um, you need to deliver newer and superior services to your customers. So what's starting to, starting to happen, where you're starting to see in this evolution now, is new markets are popping up. Um, um, driven by new business models, by new competitors that you never saw or thought of before. And uh, it's now about survival, transform or die. The, you know, you all know Netflix. You know, one of the key things that Netflix set out to solve was late fees and rewind charges that the, the then video providers used to charge you. And they set about to s deal with that because that was a, a need by the customers that they were serving. And of course, well, the rest is history. You know, we, we saw now what happened to uh, Blockbuster. You know, these guys you know, embraced the change and made it happen. And we're going to talk about how all that uh, came about. So now it's r really this digital transformation about an evolution in the, the processes and the technology. And um, you know, being able to create digitally enhanced offerings uh, to your 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 customers. <clears throat> so, if I look for just you know, a definition, say, digital transformation is how organizations uh, are gonna change fundamentally in order to deliver new value to their customers. So it's a rethinking of how an organization is going to use the technology, the people, and the processes in their organization. So it's not about doing things faster and cheaper. It's not about finding an entirely new way to do something new. So you now are now starting to ask, well, what can the technology do? Um, and how, does my, how do I adapt my business to make the, the most of my uh, technology investments? So, <clears throat> well, all this is going on, if you think about it, what is core to the transformation is the customer. And the customer can be the guys on the outside, as well as those guys on the inside. Your employees, your partners, um, uh, distributors, etc. Et 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 now, if you think about that now, is that each of these people are all have a myriad of, of devices. How many devices do we all have? Five each? So there's a plethora of um, devices accessing your applications, which can live on premises as well as in the cloud. So what's happening now is that things are getting much more complex and the, the business now has to deliver a consistent experience to their end user, their customer, both internal and external, across all of these um, devices. Okay? So what now is happening is that the business is starting to see that there is a systemic risk in availability because I need to keep all of this available to my customer unless I start to um, um, experience you know, trust issues brand damage, and so on. So that's, these are some of the things that, they're, that they're, they're, we're, we're being challenged on. So 
Well, let's think about it. Some facts about um, you know, operations in today's day and age. We're saying that operations and information flow are inseparable. You know, the IT is now the epicenter of uh, how the organization interacts with its customers, both internal and external. I keep saying that. Don't forget about the guys inside. And so IT is now used to create you know, very efficient supply chains, um, highly efficient operations and workflows. And these things together are creating this explosion in data, so, which all now has to be managed. More risk again. So the C-level guys, those gray-haired fellows in the, in, you know, on the top floor, they are now thinking um, about the technology and info information risk and how to manage and mitigate this. You start to have questions such as, am I compliant? There's GDPR, there's a local data protection and other compliance regulations. How reliable am I? Again, across all of the, the connected devices. Can I be trusted? Is, you know, you know, you know, do they trust my brand and trust me to be able to deliver? So, oops, back up, sorry. So business must now this ha make some decisions because everything ha comes at a cost. How resilient do they need to be? Because resilience really is a continuum. You know, what level of competitive advantage or disadvantage will I have depending on my resilience state? And we can talk a little bit later on about how a business, um, what are some of the things that affects a res resilience of a business. And the thing here that most of us are familiar, these are typical disruptive events, I don't know if you can all see that, but along, you know, the, this is the frequency of, of such an event occurring, you know, ha most frequent, less frequent. Along this axis here, you can't really see it so well, is the consequences in terms of cost from very high cost to not so high cost. But what really, most of us being you know, data practitioners, we really think about these areas where, where that are disruptive. Because we, we really put the disruptive events into three categories, you know, data-driven, business-driven, and event-driven, you know, natural disasters, and so on. But most of us think about the, this area as how we as IT practitioners can affect um, um, that affect how my IT uh, infrastructure operates. You know, viruses, you know, dis, you know data corruption, um, um, you know, growth in data, <clears throat> and so on. And then, you know, we don't really think so much about this part. You know, governance, you know, new products being created by a competitor, you know, you know changes in standards. Um, you know, in accessibility and so on. And then as we come down into this part where we're, we think about this often, you know, si well, not civil unrest, but power outages, um, you know, uh, natural disasters such as, as um, floods and, um, and um, hurricanes and so on. So what we're saying, though, is that from a business resilience standpoint, the business must be able to survive any of these events survive and operate through it. And again, as IT practitioners, we only focus on here. No, we need to think of all of this. We need to find uh, infrastructure that can allow us to be resilient right through any of these. And we're going to talk about it in a minute. So if you want to define business resilience from a business perspective, thinking about those three main areas of um, disruptions, right? is how quickly the business can adapt to whether planned or unplanned, man-made or natural um, events, and how to be able to maintain continuous operations through that event. You want to safeguard your people, meaning my people need to be able to continue to operate. My assets, I need to safeguard my data, and I need to protect my brand equity. I need to be available. So those are the things that business think about. So the business now has to be very aware of what are the risk areas and the process workflows that must be protected through the disaster, through the event. 
So it's no longer, I mean, people think about this as, you know, disaster recovery, but it's no longer about that. It's not about recovering after an event, but be able to continue through the event. With me so far? We are tested at the end, you know. So what we're saying is that IT resilience is core inside of the business resilience. Business resilience are thinking about people and the processes needing to maintain um, you know, full business operations you know, in the event of a disruption. Where IT resilience also looks at the technology needed as well as the, the people and the processes. But it's core to the business. In trying to define IT resilience then, right, which is a subset of the business resilience, you know, an organization's ability to maintain a, an acceptable service level through and beyond uh, a, a severe disruption of the critical business processes and the systems that support them. Yeah? So think about it now for you IT practitioners that you know, biz, IT resilience really has six fundamental components to it. You know, defending, which is secure, you, know, you need to secure your data, you need to take the steps that's going to reduce the possibility of a system failure. So you're going to defend that infrastructure. You need to be able to detect when something has gone wrong. You need to be able to remediate. You must have a plan, preferably automated or and simplified, so to address the effects of a disruption. Of course, you need to be able to recover the operations after, an, after disruption. And then there's that feedback loop. Diagnose what went wrong, right? So you identify root causes and then refine your plan so that you get better over time. So, you know, we're always talking about, you know, digital transformation. But it's not, it, it cannot be done without a transformed IT infrastructure, which is resilient. And this slide really is talking about, you know, the three main components of um, digital transformation. One is speed. You need to be able to outpace the competition, uh, you know, with a simplified and modernized IT infrastructure. And that is going to require automation as well. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But all of this is going to re re reside and require a resilient IT infrastructure. No downtime, no data loss, consistent experience across the, 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 the methods that your customers connect with you and minimize um, downtime. And then, of course, now you now require agility. And this really help, you know, if we, we think about it, those disruptive events that are, you know, regional or disasters and so on. I need the ability or the agility to move. So if there's a disruptive event where I cannot operate here, I need to be able to move my workload, failover if you like, if, if you like a better word, to somewhere else. So I need to be able to use different clouds, um, you know, move my workload so I can continue operations somewhere else. I can also use this approach to scale. If I need more, more um, uh, resources, I can move my workloads uh, elsewhere. <clears throat> All right, so what we want to do really is think about this transformation, right, through IT resilience. IT resilience, we're talking about the resiliency of your infrastructure and your operations. So by, you know, you can now adapt to change faster without disrupting the business as you do go through that, uh, you know, through that, um, that transformation. Um, you want to be able to accelerate and support um, the data-oriented initiatives, that is new product creation to deliver new services to the, to the end customer and a uh, path of achieving continuous availability and busi business resilience. So I went through that rather quickly. 
because I wanted to get to a part where we can talk a little bit more about this. These three components that go together to create a resilient business. The businesses don't have technology just for the fun of it. It's to deliver services to the customer. And so with that in mind, they need to be ensure that regardless of what the type of disruption is, you can continue operation. There's a discussion on how this relates back to the hyper-converged uh, platform because this platform now is the, gives the organization that ability now to, to automate and to remove the complexities uh, that are associated with trying to manage complex infrastructure. You cannot, you, you know, as we had mentioned this morning, you cannot, uh, you don't have that kind of flexibility when you're carrying along different uh, vendor technologies, separate silos for storage, separate for compute, separate for network. When, the, when one thing fails, you, you know, or you need to upgrade one side. The difficulty now is that you have multiple vendors um, and dependent components to, to manage. So you need an invisible infrastructure that will allow you to, to um, move along in that, in that regard. I don't know if, if there's a thing you can um, open the floor to a, I mean, I a discussion. We, I guess we would put it out to the audience as mm -hmm. to You know, do they think that in, in your organization today you have and have achieved what we call IT resilience? Meaning that um, have you experienced failure, but you're still able to operate? Have you ever, have you ever experienced an outage um, from an IT perspective, whether it be from your desktop to an application that is running within your environment, and your IT person has said to you, or you have said to the business, um, don't worry about it, because whatever fails, we have, we have an alternative plan or an alternative operation that will keep us going. Um, I, put it out to the, I put it out to the audience. Um, do you have that? And um, what are some of the questions that you want to ask in terms of achieving that? Um, what are some of the things that you face in, 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 um, in making your IT infrastructure resilient. And when we talk about your IT infrastructure, we're talking about your data center. We're talking about your end users in terms of what they use and, and the applications that they ac um, access. And we're talking about your branch networks and any applications that you may access otherwise, as, so from your partners or from the club. Um, what are some of the things that you're thinking about today that you'd like to, to, to ask about um, how do I do this or how do I do that? Mm -hmm. any, any questions? What, what? Anything that comes to mind? Oh, what I, I find fascinating, yes. uh, because even though you have the BCP arrangements and you, you also have things in place to deal with downtime, I find just that first statement that says adapting to change without disrupting the business, you know, quite fascinating. And awesome. if we could have built on that. Okay. I've, I've so you want to build on that? Yes. That in I'm terms doing. of um, how do you go about building an infrastructure, building a core, a data center, so that even when you're, you have um, your, your ravaged by ransomware, or you have a hardware failure, or you have an application that decided that you know, it's, you know, it's going bonkers, or you have a situation where you have an entire site where the power fails. How do you continue to operate? Yeah. You have different scenarios there. Mm -hmm. One, you have to have, for most people, they would have um, backups. So most of the times when IT thinks about um, you know, protecting data and protecting applications, they say to management, well, we have done our data backups. Our management signs off and says, well, our company is protected, and in the event of a problem, we are good to go. The first problem that usually happens is that 
those backups are done to tape. So hmm. those tapes are once a bunch of them are kept in the office, so that if there is a file, usually there is a problem. And secondly, a bunch of them are actually kept off-site, and they said, well, we have tapes on-site, and we have tapes off-site. But if you ask the IT person, when was the last time that you actually took one of those tapes and actually tested it <laughs> to see if, yeah, you have been backing up all these months, can you actually restore that backup? Exactly. Um, so that is one problem. The second thing is, is the speed of recovery. So we talk about your recovery point objective. For most companies, they, they, they are into this thing about, uh, I can operate my business even if I were to lose a day's worth of data. So therefore, a backup usually means, a daily backup means that there's 24 hours between backups. So therefore, a company is actually saying that my RPO is 24 hours. And if you're saying that your RPO is 24 hours, that means that if you operate your business within an eight hour day, that means eight hours of work across all your employees, there's a potential for loss. And sometimes management, we ask them and they say, you know, that is acceptable because we can have people punch back in the data or, or whatever it is. But what they don't, what, what is not told to them is that when a disaster actually happens and you have a 24 hour RPO, what it means is that someone has to gather first the right tapes if you're doing tapes. They have to sequence those tapes and they have to restore that data onto maybe new servers if your servers are destroyed. And then the data that is lost, they have to re put that data. That takes days, yep. sometimes weeks, sometimes you never ever recover right. because if your velocity of your data is such that you're doing many transactions per minute or anything like that, you will never recover. And that is why small businesses and most medium sized businesses, once they experience a disaster, they are out of business because you never Can recover that data. So therefore, your customer records are out of sync, everything becomes manual, and you just can't manage it. So, so if you think about it now, as companies now are becoming more and more dependent, once I, more, sorry, you had a question? No, I'm just thinking that from a risk perspective, mm -hmm. that the company should actually do really, and maybe, right, from a more mature organization, you have a risk process and independent of IT, yes. they should then be doing an assessment really to determine because they can't just say everybody's going for all oh, these are the criticality of the application and this is not the use you actually get in which you got what the things that we're doing. So as I said, data may be lots of things going for all these are the volume of transactions that is conducted. So it's specific to the industry, specific to the entity and where you're at maturity and as you say you can't simply just be back on the tapes yes you can be back on the tapes at the end of the day but i don't know how many folks actually be back on the tape versus um sending it every 10 minutes that should log into your dr site so that if um, your data on site gets corrupted you can actually switch to that alternative location right you're you're actually very right about right. risk so you're talking about the business impact and that has to be done and many times the business leaves that up to the IT person to do okay. which we are saying you know the you as a CEO you as you you as the business people you're actually responsible for the running of the company right. so Not therefore IT. those those um those objectives those 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 characteristics should be determined by you right Not so by IT. The and IT should then execute based upon the business must determine the risk of the different processes yeah. in the organization. I've mentioned that in the beginning. And, and this make a decision as to you know, how resilient they, that particular thing needs to be. So, you know, as Ono just mentioned a while ago, yeah, so they have these two measures which people are familiar with. You know, res restore recovery point and restore time. So this is the point at which, you know, you can recover your data to. And I'll show you a sign in a short while I can show you where, you know, if you're a bit doing backups once a day, right, 
It's dependent on the replication um, technology you use. You can replicate continuously or you can replicate once every time t. The thing is, is that the data alone is not the whole picture. It's the applications as well. So you have this thing that we call the real RTO, the real recovery time. That's, not, that's the time that it takes you to get the data restored, the applications restored, and the users operating again. Okay, so we have uh, this. And this is what Honor was saying a while ago. So these circles here are the points in time that you do a replication, a backup, yeah, every X hours. And the idea to get true resiliency in this digital age that we're moving in is to try and get these circles as close together as you can so we'll minimize this data loss because if you have a if you have a failure here just before the next replication you've lost that so that has to be re-entered hopefully you have it to re-enter it yeah but is there um, from the replication perspective perspective there's some risk with uh, replication um, in terms of uh, threats or, or a compromise being replicated. So in the, in the instance, and, uh, <laughs> um, a couple years back, we ran somewhere. That yeah, you replicate the ransomware. You replicated the ransomware <laughs> yeah. and all that. So you yeah. know, in terms of this, what controls would you need to put in place right. to um, protect against that? That's a nice question for one of my rock stars. Here. Which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? <laughs> well, the protection for that is actually what we call um, the ability to replicate data and to actually have checkpoints right. as you replicate. So therefore, you must be able to replicate to your DR site or to multiple DR sites and then be able to roll back to any point in time. So if your ransomware happened at 10 o'clock this morning, you want technology that can get you back to 9.59. That's how close you want your, your reputation to be. And technologies exist today that get you there. Right. We call it the time machine of the day or something. Right, right. <laughs> That's what it is. Yes. Right now, today, you can roll back, not only a, a virtual machine or a server, imagine a database. Roll back down to the second that you want. Right. That technology is available today with that granularity. Yeah. So in terms now of risk, okay? So risk essentially is the product of the probability of something happening and the, the value of that thing that it happened to, okay? So let's think about it here now. I'm doing, say, continuous backups. So my RPO is a, some seconds, right? And the time for me to get, to get operation again, 15 minutes, yeah? Say that costs you X dollars in terms of the, what you lose in terms of productivity and etc. X dollars. Let's look at some scheduled replication. Every four hours maybe, right? It's four, well, when you calculate it, it's 45 times this. And much less what people, most Jamaica is doing, which is backups. And that's a once a day backup. 275 times because you've lost all of that time and sometimes more because if you've lost the, the, the application as well as the data in, in a true disaster then now you're going to have to buy iron, reload applications, reconfigure, restore data, then restore operations. So in terms of risk, it's quite high. And what we want to do for a true resilient organization, if we are talking about doing digital transformation and going digital. You can't do that with this scenario. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah? Yeah, say, so, you know, you have been on the block several times and now you have say, moved on from secret 2000 to secret 2016 with much greater complexity, worse you have cyber security concerns and you have certificate management. How do you get this resilience really working like right. an oil machine? You, you, you do need a, a resilient platform to start with. A 
And um, in our presentation, just that was presentation earlier this morning, uh, we, we moved to the, the fact that this thing is called hyperconvergence. It's hyperconverged infrastructure. So it's a platform that's, that's you know, gonna do some self-healing. Uh, it makes it simpler, if you want to just expound. I want to add, side. basically try to answer that question with one single word. Software is the answer. There's no way, if, if, if we all, any of us try to continue scanning machines every X number of months for hardening, for security vulnerabilities, if we are doing that, that was 10, 20 years ago. Today, the software is more powerful than us, it's faster than us, and it's probably more accurate than us. Scanning for security issues is a repetitive task, is that correct? Why not let software do it? Today we have analytics, we have business, business uh, artificial intelligence, we have all those tools built into technologies like hyperconvergence. So in your example, migrating from SQL X to SQL whatever, there are tools that can do that for me, bring in the data, the objects, uh, the scripts, and my reporting services, whatever, and at the same time, scanning everything for security, finding issues, and even making decisions for me. So if your database, then let's say I migrate from here to here, and this new database, I put it in a platform that is not secure. There's software that can say, hey, you are not compliant because of this issue we found, and let me move it if you want. The software can even move it to the right location, whether it's another cloud, whether it's another cluster in my data center, it doesn't matter. It's software doing that nowadays. Exactly. So, so in short, you can automate all of that. Right. But the thing is that you, you can't, you cannot need to, because the the pace of change that's happening now. Twenty years ago, ago, uh, the global two thousand companies, fifty percent of them are gone or have been uh, bought up. Even more scary than that, in the nineteen fifties, the global five hundred ninety percent are gone. So it's happening and happening faster. And you need to be able to take the people out of it as much as you can. I mean, the other day, um, one of us had to do a, um, an upgrade, I don't want to call the names, uh, for, for a company. And um, it was the, the old school, old style upgrade. Yeah? And it was, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to do that. And it's just like long, laborious and so on. And error prone, you know, you lose your weekend and, and all that. Those, those days done. You know, you know that company Yahoo. Remember Yahoo? Not really around anymore. They could not keep up with the changes needed on the on the hardware side. They weren't on the ACI. That's why the Google guys took off. They couldn't keep up. And so they're they're in the boneyard. And I think one of the one of the difficult things for us as IT people is, you know, the business people have hired us to do a job. And for too long, we have been stuck in the mode of, if we are not running around and seeming busy, then we are not doing our job. Mm -hmm. And management actually perpetuates that cycle by saying, you know, if you guys are not busy, then I'm going to downsize. I don't need so many IT people because you guys are sitting on idle. But right. the whole purpose of IT is to support the business and its objectives. Not to keep the lights up. Fight fires, not to not to be, you know, plugging in cables and all of that. That sort of IT is done. You know, one of my favorite questions, sorry to interrupt, yes. uh, along the lines of IT resilience is for any IT administrator in the room, are you, let's be 100% honest, are you a little bit scared or afraid of the technology you are managing, yes or no? If somebody tells me no, <laughs> I dare that person to come to the front and let's talk about it. I want, I want to see that person uh, going to their old SAM and running an update just because the vendor just released a new update. Who wants to touch a SAM and apply an update, a firmware patch? Who wants to do it? It's the opposite. People say, do not touch it. Do not breathe next to it. Do not even look at it. Am I right? Because that thing may break. And I want it alive. I want to keep it as it is. 
Same thing applies to servers. Same thing applies to many applications. So I call IT resilience. When I go into my data center, I look at it, and then I go on vacation, and the next day I'm this guy here. I don't want to care. I received an alert. This failed. Fine. I st I'm still on the beach. Because something will take care of it. Not someone, something. There's software, software in charge of balancing, healing, doing whatever it has to do. Another this failed, I should still be like this guy. Right. But that's not the way I do right. it. Right. So, you know, and uh, things are happening and moving faster. So you can't be carrying around the old traditional infrastructure. You just don't have, you don't have the resources or the time to respond fast enough. You need to be that guy. You need the, the infrastructure that allows you to do that. And it's not because I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. And I think the companies that still have their IT doing brick fix yeah. will feel it eventually in yeah. that you need your IT to be creating resilient platforms creating resilient applications and delivering to business partners, customers, and employees. And one of the things that we, that most of the time is neglected is actually the employee. Nobody protects the employee's data, the employee's work. It's always what is on the server. What about your Excel files? What about your Word stuff? What about um, that is a database that you have running in access that is on your machine that is controlling maybe 20% of the company's revenue that the finance controller might have it on, on its machine. That may be backed up maybe once every month or once every quarter. And we have that running. So nobody thinks about all the different yep. assets, digital assets that need to be protected. And that is why the whole issue of a business impact analysis is important. Yeah. And not only that, but finding out where does your data lie and how do I go around protecting that. You know, I was in another um, presentation earlier and Chris Record, I don't know if any of you guys were in that presentation, um, said a, a really nice, nice thing on digital transformation. You know, uh, you know, trying to explain to a person who really wasn't getting it, really wasn't understanding it, someone from a bank and the question that they asked the, 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 the banker was, well, how long does it take to open a new account? Right, I, I, I come to you, you don't know anything about me, how long does it take? Anybody, anybody? How long does it take to open a new bank account? The person said, two weeks or so, you know. I need to get this, I need to get that, you're gonna to have to get that sign with that person, all of that. How long does it take for two weeks? Okay, all right. How about do it in five minutes from one of these? Impossible to know, that's digital transformation. What am I going to do on the inside, behind the scenes, to make that possible? Mm -hmm. And you can't do that on the old, the old stuff where you have your IT people keeping the lights on. They need to be there innovating. That's really what we're, what we're good for. And, and some of the technologies that you can, you can actually employ within your organization are actually quite simple. I mean, if you're a small organization, um, a small hyperconverged platform can be can can run your business. I mean, hyperconverged platforms runs from very small to very large. That runs Apple, runs Walmart, and so forth. Um, when you talk about the the end users, simple backup routines or running virtual desktop infrastructure can actually help you to protect those um, employees' work and offer the mobility at the same time because I think the, 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 the days where work is a place that you go to is also done. It's, it's no longer thing, exists. Thing that you do. Work is a thing that you do. So therefore, you must allow your employees to work from any location on any device. And if you have moved towards that, I don't think any of the new millennials that are coming up in the next 10 years will be working for your company because that's what they expect but, but there's a problem there uh, on the you said something true i mean mobile workspaces that's only a trend and we are open to be doing it but there's also the belief that i'm a small company you mentioned small businesses yes. let's say i have only 10 employees mm -hmm. how am i going to embark in a virtual desktop or virtual workspace project if, I, it's, if it's 10 of us it's easier for me to buy 10 PCs than hiring uh, 
the, I want to say the name, the Citrix consultant to come for three months and implement yes. a VDI project, which is going to cost me $100,000, right? Yes, that's right. Maybe just half of it is consulting, and the other half is, is software. So why am I going to do it if I have 10 people shopping? And that's a, that's a good question. But there are other ways to go about and I'm sure that you'll let you let me know. Without going into too much detail, I just want us to know that, again, the answer is there's new options. Yes. I don't have to go into that six months project, spend $100,000. I can say, you know, if I have that hyper-converged foundation block, I can say, I can add, remember my example about the Legos? Those who were in my presentation in the morning, I talked about Legos. Add the VDI Lego block. Turn on that functionality for only 10 users. Get it going in an hour. Imagine setting up a virtual workspace in one hour for 10 or for 1,000 users. It's exactly the same uh, complexity. Nowadays, you can do it in one hour with the same platform you use every day for the other tasks. It's the same technology. Just turn it on. Um, well, are there any other comments or thoughts? You've got the rock stars here to answer any of the questions. No, we still have anything else. Sorry, it's over the fence. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, the, the, the question I, I, I throw into the mix, just to, just to uh, promote thoughts, really, is when we start talking about replication and yeah, hyper converge and all that, we're talking about um, cloud and cloud technology for the most part. So the question that would come to mind is, um, the new legislation, um, GDPR, and all our privacy um, regulations that know will have an impact on jurisdiction where data is stored, where data is kept. And um, how do you keep track of that to ensure that whichever clients that you're working with um, still remain compliant uh, in terms of how they store data? What would be your advice to the clients uh, from that perspective? You know, if, if I may start off, the, the Data Protection Act mm -hmm. that is being contemplated actually speaks to an officer that they call a data protection officer. Right? And that data protection officer is responsible and can be fined, can be imprisoned if, if um, they are found in violation of the, the actual. Um, now, that data protection officer has to utilize uh, what we call different tools to ensure that data does not move. Certain data, because you have to classify the data. First thing you have to do is classify the data. Then, after you classify that data, say, this data cannot be in the US, this data has to be onshore, this data can possibly be in, a, in the Commonwealth, and for example, it can be in Canada then you now have to now have what we call security software constructs mm -hmm. around that data that says, guess what? This data cannot move off my private cloud, which is within my premises and, and what I know. And cannot move out and be protected, even, even, even from a disaster recovery standpoint, somewhere else where that data actually turns out to be what we call non compliance of the law. So technology is there to actually do that, right. but it is not a simple. From the perspective of, um, of some of the technologies, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot yes. to ask. So. <laughs> yes. um, would your technology facilitate then the um, obfuscation mm -hmm. of that data uh, if you are if you are to store it in other jurisdiction? In other words, while it's on that platform, it is not intelligible information mm -hmm. um, except when you access it and have the relevant um, decoders on your systems to pull the data back. Because um, the you know, solutions, um, the resilient solutions that you have with that, does it take those things into consideration? Yes, it does. So therefore, the what happens is that um, from a security standpoint, the data is only intelligible or can be read by you because it uses what we call a public key infrastructure. So therefore, you have your, you have your private key, the public key is, is out there. And therefore, the only person that can unlock that data is the actual owner of that data. 
So therefore, even the public providers themselves cannot, and I put that in quotes, <laughs> cannot access that data. It's actually just um, that. And but as you know, countries are now asking for backdoor keys <laughs> to <laughs> that data. So therefore, the data protection officer within that company still have to evaluate as to what are the risks to my data, just in case Uncle Sam or others have a backdoor key to the data. Very good, thanks. All right, that's it. That's it, that's it. Well, oh. well, what you said to our position is that well, in the infrastructure in, uh, pre resilient technology for them to make the transition. We will, we will sell that. No, yeah, I think what you're saying is that um, you know, you know, and we've come across those those yeah. companies that they have a great deal of investment Index. in you know well, San and well, three tier investment. How do you get them? How do you, what do you say to them to get them? I, I mean, indeed, that's over fifty percent of our customers. They always yeah. have investments, and yeah. that's why we come. I mean, every case is different, of course, but we always try to come and find the best way to utilize existing infrastructure. We are never going to ask anyone to throw away what you have unless it's pretty old. But typical example is they have a storage appliance that I don't care about the brand or technology. It's there. I bought it a couple of years ago. It's good. It's probably not as good as this new technology, but it's good. We don't want you to throw it away. Let's find a good way to repurpose it. Maybe it becomes a new backup target. Maybe it becomes a, a storage for a physical cluster that you still have to have outside of the virtual, virtual black. And there's so many ways. And of course, every case is going to be different. But yes, we always find or try to find the best way to reutilize what is there if possible. Well, it's not now really um, a recommendation that is part of the new resilient What? Um, the, the question is, uh, is there a, a middle ground where some of that technology can still be part of the I mean, yeah. resilient and they will yes. Yes. Yeah. They will yes. We have several customers who run the old yeah. cluster alongside with the new one. They are being managed on the same console for years until they finally migrate from the old yeah. cluster. What, what you can do, Isaac, you could put some of the non-critical workloads on there and move the most critical, high risk, expensive, you know, to the business workloads on the, the new HCI. Um, until that infrastructure gets end of life and then you, you know, you well, deep six it. It wouldn't be just to basically mount it as a storage target. Right. You know, from, from the new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So you essentially That's run right. your IT on the new equipment, but you know, anything that would be a file server or anything that doesn't necessarily have a lot of data. Right. You can still keep it on there, but it basically becomes a, a mounted storage. Yeah. Both technologies use standard protocols. There's nothing yeah. Uh, yeah, dark here. Yeah. People use standard uh, communication protocols. They can coexist. We can publish storage from us to the outside or consume storage from outside systems. So again, coexisting is something that we do every single day if possible. Right. Now, it's yeah, granted, you will put your best or most critical applications on the new one. Yeah. Right. Possible. And it's always good that if you if you if you are not moving towards IT resilience, it's now good that you now choose a project. So anything that <coughs> that comes up, you say, okay, I'm going to put it on the new resilience. Right, right. Okay. Good.